Why can't we all just get along? Why do Protestants and Catholics disagree on justification and who's right? Well, the short answer is Protestants and Catholics process the biblical information differently. Yet, of course, I will make the case for you in this video as to why I prefer the Protestant view and explain why I believe my solution to this problem is inherently Reformed Protestant. We are all aware of the at times mind-breaking process of trying to interpret the Bible, right? If this has never been a problem for you, you've probably never read your Bible, like, at all. Because when you do, you have to give an explanation for why Paul pounds out repeatedly this idea of justification by faith apart from works or alone. And one of the other guys on the team, James, says verbatim that we are justified by works. What the heck is going on here? Now, if you are a modern Catholic, or if you know one like I do, shout out to Nick over at the Catholic OCD podcast, you're aware that Catholics, and I applaud them for this, have a desire to take the words of both the apostles, that's Paul and James, at a modern face value. In both cases, honestly, I wish more Christians would take the Bible literally today. Nonetheless, if you take this approach here, you are forced into a hard embrace the mystery of our salvation approach. Again, I also appreciate this, and I think people who don't believe in the Trinity because of modern logic need to embrace the mystery a little more. Certainly, there are things about God we simply cannot fully and totally understand, and that's okay. It doesn't mean we can't study them or develop our own views based on the scriptures, yet sometimes when we don't embrace the mystery, we can fall off into the heretical and actually go outside the bounds of scripture and or apostolic teaching. That said, the Catholic solution to the alleged Paul James frenemy situation forces you into a more complicated structure and dismantling of the word justification along with the concept of biblical soteriology. This is why I prefer Calvinism. Again, I'll explain as we continue the reason for the modern confusion, disagreement, divide, etc., as well as why I think the simpler reformed Calvinism, if you want to call it that, is the more biblically faithful view. Now, I have already noted this in my previous videos. Everyone sees this apparent contradiction in the scriptures as noted in this statement by Jonathan Edwards. And again, the modern Catholic view, which does have historical roots yet roots that still didn't develop for centuries after the ministry of the apostles, this modern Catholic view really locks in a smaller modern range of meaning for all of the above, faith, works, justification. Therefore, they are forced into two different justifications, a justification of the ungodly, this is the salvation and legal declaration of the belief by faith that Paul speaks of, and a justification of the godly, meaning the continued justification or maybe declarative tune-up of an already saved person by works, as James puts it. This is an insanely important topic, to be sure. That's because justification is the thing that legally puts us in right relationship with God, something we all want to have with certainty, correct? To complicate things further, the word justification is the same word that is often translated as righteous or righteousness in your Bible, dikaiosis as a noun or dikaiao as a verb. Now, it was the major and adamant contention of the reformers that this word, in the Greek was an inherently legal declaration over a person. This usage of the word can be seen in 2 Corinthians 3, 9 and elsewhere, where justification, a spoken, declared, credited, counted, pronounced, or rendered righteousness, oh my goodness, remember it's the same word, is in direct contrast to condemnation, the legal sentence of guilt and implied death. Nonetheless, stop here for a sec to recognize this legal declared righteousness of the reformers. It's true. Now for the Catholics, justification as a process is the infusing, notice the word choice there, of righteousness into a believer so that they are made righteous. And this plays not only into the justification I just told you about, that's 
the justification of the saved person by their own righteousness that is within them working, you know, the Catholic distinction. But it also plays into the initial justification of the ungodly, as noted in this statement by popular Catholic YouTuber Jimmy Akin. I would acknowledge that there is a sense in which we are declared righteous by God forensically because of what Christ did. I would also say there are a couple of missing steps in that, but that's true as far as it goes. We are declared legally righteous because of what Christ did. I would offer a deeper analysis and say that part of what Christ did was he took away our sins and he's given us righteousness in the form of charity in our heart, so he's also made us righteous, and consequently God can legally declare us righteous. I'm not sure if you caught that, but this little statement literally and fully explains the Catholic and Protestant divide on God's saving process in us. He could also declare us righteous on the basis of what he did to us internally, because we are righteous. Catholicism says God both declares us and makes us righteous. That justifies us in their terminology. And that this making righteous is actually sufficient in theory, apart from the legal declaration. So what's the problem with this? Well, are you also a sinner? I'm assuming you've answered in the affirmative. Then how do you know you are right with God? And what security can you possibly have that you know him if you still sin even after you've become a baptized believer in Jesus. This single issue sparked the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago when a conscious riddled monk named Martin Luther just couldn't find the security he needed for his salvation while he drove his priest crazy with his constant confessions. All of this brings us to the Protestant revival of the legal imputed justification we read about in Romans 4 where Paul uses the word credited, that's imputed in the Latin, to describe the righteousness we have by faith. So there we go. Protestants, imputed righteousness. And do you think Martin Luther was just a little excited about this discovery of an ancient truth? By the way, this is also one of the reasons I left Catholicism when I was a teenager. Yes, I was raised Catholic. No, I didn't fully understand Catholic doctrine at the time. But I did read my Bible and understand this concept of a declared righteousness based on faith in Christ alone. I think it's pretty easy to see there in Romans 4. And now that I do fully understand the difference, this is something that I think Catholicism both overlooks and underemphasizes with major implications fleshed out in the way they practice their faith. I think it explains the emphasis on ritual and aversion to physical signs of salvation as opposed to fruits in the life of the believer or even just God's spoken word over us that we are justified in his sight. In fact, a huge part of the collateral damage Catholic soteriology levels on the security of a believer has to do with the fact that an infused righteousness can die in their belief and in their eyes, a once saved soul could spend an eternity in hell. And for me personally, eternal security actually produces more, not less, holiness in my life. Is this the case for you? Feel free to leave your thought in the comments. In my opinion, Catholic soteriology leads to hyperscrupulosity for a lot of people, whereas just like the woman caught in adultery, I actually feel empowered to serve Christ more when he tells me, your sins are forgiven. Now go and leave your life of sin. Again, justification is so important because how we answer some of these basic definitions has major impact on our effectiveness as a Christian and the way and confidence with which we practice our faith. Little angles with a wide trajectory. On top of these things is the actual biblical usage of the word, which again pushes me to the Protestant side. You see, the conversation is a little deceptive because when we talk about righteousness or justification, what we are actually talking about is total or perfect righteousness. This is the only way we can ever enter into God's presence legally. That is without being Thanos snapped out of existence. I am inevitable. This was James's theology when he said, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking 
all of it. Honestly, how can we ever depend on an infused righteousness alone? He could also declare us righteous on the basis of what he did to us internally, because we are righteous. It's just not adequate. From a Protestant perspective, we certainly do have the righteous nature of Jesus working within us and propelling us into Christ-likeness, yet how can we even have a relationship with God, apart from a legal declaration. This is, quite frankly, the exact reason both Paul and James use justification in a declarative sense. It's also why the Protestant justification, righteousization, leads to a healthier Christian lifestyle, and why, for the Reformers and Paul himself, it was worth dying for, a justification by faith, and faith alone, not on the basis of works. This is a credited, to use Paul's words, righteousness. It explains how we can sin, which we all do, and still be righteous at the same time. This was Luther's whole point. It's pretty amazing when you think about it, right? This is why I am definitively and declaredly Protestant, even after all these years. And this brings me to my solution of the Paul James problem. I sure hope you didn't forget about that one, because that's really at the heart of this video. Why can't we all get along? Well, the reason I'm saying this is because my solution to that problem actually sparked some confusion in one of the comments of my last video. Remember, the way we interpret biblical words has far-reaching implications, as is evidenced in our analysis of justification. Modern Catholics look at justification in James and Paul as the same word and meaning. Therefore, they need two different justifications, one for the godly and one for the ungodly. Most Protestants, on the other hand, including Calvin and Edwards, opt to change James's definition of justification and swap it with the word vindication. And the range of meaning allows for this. Yet they mean, according to their view of James, that we receive outward recognition through good works, recognition of our right standing that we already have by faith alone. But again, as Protestants and Reformed Christians, we believe in the five solas. We believe in the Westminster Confession. We believe in election, in irresistible grace, in perseverance. But we certainly don't all agree on every interpretation of every biblical passage. Neither do modern Catholics, for that matter, nor any other branch of our faith. In a quote I've already shown many times, Jonathan Edwards offers two possible resolutions to the James Paul issue from the Protestant side of things when he says, either the word faith or else the word justify is not to be understood precisely in the same sense as the same terms when used by St. Paul. So there we go. Two different ways of approaching the Paul James problem from the Reformed side of things. I've previously explained why I opt for that second option, an option about which Edwards elaborates. If notwithstanding, any choose to take justification in St. James precisely as we do in Paul's epistles, what has already been said concerning the manner in which acts of obedience are concerned in the affairs of our justification affords a very clear and full answer. For if we take works as acts or expressions of faith, they are not excluded. So a man is not justified by faith only, but also by works. Okay, well, I choose to take James this way. But notice the basis for Edward's claim of faith in a fuller sense. He is not justified only by faith as a principle in the heart or in its first and more imminent acts, but also by the effective acts of it in life, which are the expressions of of the life of faith. In my view, this really gets more to the heart of the matter when it comes to biblical interpretation, and this applies to everyone. Are we actually being biblical? Not contemporary, not scientific, whatever that means, not rational, not modern or cultural, but are we being biblical or understanding biblical culture? when we define our terms. You see, this is the key. Whether we are modern Protestants or modern Catholics, again, Edwards notes the tendency of the ancient Hebrews to use what's called synecdoche, or part for the whole language. They did this a lot, and with many different concepts, just like we do today when we say nice wheels, meaning the whole car, or with this ring, I thee wed, meaning 
Through the entirety of this ceremony and all of my associated actions, I am entering into a marriage with you using the example of marriage. Do you see how the physical ring within this figure of speech is seen as the whole of marriage? The ring isn't the relationship, but it represents the relationship and the way we talk and perceive things. This is how I see James speaking of faith. I say this because even if we change justification to vindication, we still have the same concept of an outward legal acquittal in James. What I see going on is a difference in the vocabulary of the ancient Hebrews, Paul and James included, from that of moderns who favor more of a precision in our speech. To us, faith is usually something that takes place only in the heart, yet that is clearly not the way ancient Hebrews understood it, as evidenced in Paul's use of the word obedience in places like Romans 10.16, and his use of the phrase literally translated, obedience that is faith, in Romans 1.5. What exactly does he mean by that? How can James say that faith alone does not justify and works do? It's because to ancient Hebrews, faith was almost always seen outwardly, like in Paul's famous Hall of Faith passage in Hebrews. In James's vocabulary, Abraham was justified by, quote, works, but what he means by works is true living faith alone. Abraham's act of presenting Isaac on the altar was a form of faith, kind of like the wedding ring. Not a meritorious work, not a laborious effort springing from Abraham's inherent goodness, not an attempt to impress God. It was an outward expression of an activity of true faith. And in Edward's terminology, this was seen as the whole of faith, part for the whole. Nice wheels. With this ring, I thee wed. Bottom line, it is impossible for people to be justified by works. And what I'm saying is that when you look at things this way, it is clear that all the authors of Scripture teach salvation by faith alone. However, sometimes they use part for the whole language. And look, this is the way they spoke. Don't get all bent out of shape. Don't get upset at me. I'm not moving towards a works-based salvation. In my opinion, Catholics don't get faith right either, by the way. And this is precisely part of the problem. Contrarily, I've clearly shown you how not only the apostles, but also the apostolic fathers were far more Protestant than Catholic in modern terminology. All of these things raised these questions in this comment to my last video from Mike Schaller, 9233. Question for my Calvinist brother. If justification is by faith alone and not by works, and faith requires obedience, is obedience not a work? Or is this something God does as well? It is God who gives faith and gives the obedience to do them? So with that said, if we don't have a faith that produces good works and obedience, then we don't have faith. That's correct, Mike. Continuing. Are these gifts instantaneous at regeneration, or are they something we work toward and grow into? Is belief and faith the same thing? The answer to that is yes. If regeneration precedes faith, does it precede belief as well? Also yes. I mean no offense, but the Reformed tradition seems to have to explain and redefine terms in order to align its doctrines with Scripture. What I find interesting is that you come to the same conclusions as those that dispute you. Justification is by faith alone, but faith requires works. So really, justification is by faith and works. Where is the disagreement then? It's a difference without distinction. Thanks for that comment, Mike. And as far as when faith and works are produced in a believer, most people do believe faith is instantaneous upon regeneration. This faith immediately produces justification. From the Reformed perspective, regeneration has to precede faith and justification, as the new nature is what actually gives someone the ability to believe. Believing is the verb form of faith in the Greek, both pistis, so they're the same word, just different in the English. And a good scripture for this understanding of regeneration preceding faith is Romans ten seventeen. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing or being made alive in Christ, that's the metaphor going on there, regeneration, comes through the word of Christ. Here you can see the order of events. God's word, the gospel, produces regeneration, which then produces faith and justification. Is regeneration, in the Reformed view, an infusion of sorts? Well, yes, in a sense, but I am absolutely not talking about that in this video. 
When we talk about good works the believer grows into, which was another one of your questions, typically we're talking about the process of sanctification or making a believer more holy. Now, just to muddy the waters a bit for you, Catholics will also use justification to refer to this process. But regardless of terminology, this is a progressive process that starts after regeneration, faith, justification, but is directly connected to them and flows from them. Making sense? This process ends in our glorification when we are made perfectly like Jesus one day. Although, again, from a Protestant perspective, we are seen as perfect in his sight already because of our legal declared righteousness that we have by faith alone. As far as your statements on Reformed theology and me agreeing with my opponents, by which you mean Catholics, just for clarification purposes, I'm not saying faith requires obedience. I'm saying faith is obedience in a sense, scripturally. But specifically, I mean this in a linguistic and conceptual sense, not in a literal one. Faith is not works. What I'm saying is that Paul's Hebrew idiom, obedience of faith, is distinct from, not the same thing as, totally different conceptually to perfect obedience or the Reformed understanding of Christ's active obedience. But I am saying Paul uses the word obedience in Romans to explain what true saving faith is conceptually. His word choice, not mine. What I'm saying is that this explains James's, quote, works are actually biblical obedience. Yes, he uses the word works, but what he's actually talking about is biblical saving faith. Does this make sense? Faith is not works, but there are some gray areas where it's hard to tell the difference in the scriptures because of how they spoke about it. What I'm saying is that it's purely a language and conceptual thing. Now, if we open up faith like this, which I do believe is the correct understanding, then we do have to define works. If we don't, they would be indistinguishable from faith, right? This is a good observation. And I'm not trying to redefine all of this because we think in certain categories about things, faith and works, love and hate, spirit and flesh. This is biblical. All I'm saying is that they thought in different categories. Ancient Hebrews used words like this. Each circle represents a range of usage for how they might apply a word like faith. As an example, Paul says we are saved by faith apart from works, meaning faith alone or true saving yes Lord faith. And James uses faith in a very bad demon faith way. You know what I'm talking about, where he says the demons believe and shudder. But they're the same word in the Greek. What James is clearly referring to is thinking Jesus is Lord. Now notice the area of overlap. This represents examples where we can use either word. In James 2, James uses faith, and he wasn't wrong. You can use it like that. But he could also have said the demons think Jesus is Lord, emphasizing mental or fake non-saving faith. Now look at what happens when you try the same thing with the word trust. Do you see how there would be an overlap in the way people use these two words? Now, just for the fun of it, what if I add the word action? This is an interesting one because action might not be something you would associate with faith or trust. In modern speech, faith and trust seem to be primarily inward dispositions of the heart and soul. Actions, typically, are things like jumping, kicking, running, breathing, etc. Yet, could there be a place where these three things come together conceptually, even in the way we talk today? Well, what if I'm talking about a trust fall? Have you ever done one of those? Where you fall backwards into somebody else's arms? Well, think about the different ways you can use these three concepts, faith, trust, action, to describe that event. First, you could say, he really trusted her. Second, you could say, he really had faith in her, basically meaning the same thing. But what if you say, you should have seen his faith? Break that statement down. You can't see faith, right? But you can see the fall and the look on his face while he was falling. By this statement, you mean the actions that you're witnessing with your eyes, but you're calling them faith. What you mean is you should have seen the outward action, the way he fell into her arms. You can't see faith, but you can see the action. And in that sentence, faith 
is the action and vice versa. Thing for thing signified. Okay, now take just one more step with me. Remember, these circles represent the way the ancients talked about and visualized things. Well, we also have our own ways that we talk about things in a modern world. We value things like chronological order, categorization, linguistic precision. Basically, we like when we can explain everything, which means keeping our concepts in nice, neat little rows just like this. So what happens when we read a two to three and a half thousand year old document written by people who thought in circles and thought bubbles? But we do this through the lens of our modern glasses? Well, the result is seeing supposed contradictions between two apostles or between apostles and church fathers or between church fathers and reformers. It's not that we can't look at them through our glasses. It's just that we have to make sure we're doing our homework so that we're explaining them using the modern vernacular in a way that represents their original ideas in their original context and the way in which they saw them. But do you see how we're immediately at a disadvantage when it comes to reading the Bible? Yes, the Bible is perspicuous, easy to understand for every believer, but certainly there are problem areas, and I think what I'm saying explains some of them. Please note, again, I'm not saying we are saved by works. Works are a different thing altogether. I'm also not merging faith and works. All I'm saying is that there is room conceptually in the Hebrew faith for action. And often they would see, acknowledge, identify the outward action as the thing that created it. In my opinion, this is exactly what's going on in James 2 when he says works. He's describing faith in action. In Pastor AJ's humble little opinion, James and Paul are using the word justification in exactly the same way. Again, remember Edwards on this. I see this as a very nice compliment to Reformed fiduciary faith, and it helps to iron out some of the problem passages. You have faith and you have works. But sometimes you have instances in the ancient word soup where you could actually see either word and the distinction gets a little blurry. In those distinctions, like in James, we might prefer the phrase faith in action or maybe obedience or faith-filled obedience like we see Paul doing. It's just the way they talked about stuff. It's not a salvation by works in the Father's. It's just the way they talked. And I'm done talking now. What are your thoughts on the topic? Was this helpful? Leave those thoughts in the comments. And you know all the usual stuff. Like, share, subscribe. Check out my other videos on this topic and others. With that said, I'll see you in my next video, friends. Until then, it was great to gospel with you.